You are a clinical psychologist. I'm a clinical psychologist. You think toxic masculinity is a lie. I know toxic masculinity you know, is a lie. You yes. know, and you also know that men should not date feminists. I'm fairly, well, depend, we'll have to define terms, but yeah. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So uh, I thought there was a lot of interesting stuff we can talk about, but one of the most important things is the, it's the American Psycholo uh, Psychologist Association or? American Psychological Psychological Association. Association. Right. The APA put up these guidelines, when was it, like a year ago? Yeah, about 2018. Late 2018? No, jar January 2019 they came out. And it's basically a bunch of doctors, like psychologists, and they're... Yeah, well, actually, you explain it. You explain it. So the American Psychological Association is the governing body for the practice of psychology in the United States. And it's, it's comprised of clinicians and academicians, and they have a foot in both worlds. They have a, a foot in... Uh, education and training psychologists, and they have a foot in the clinical world, which is where I live, where you deal with real problems and real people. And they put out a list of things saying like, man bad. They have, they periodically put out treatment guidelines. So they'll have a, a treatment guidelines for schizophrenia, where they outline best practices for schizophrenia and treatment guidelines for, well, I came across a, a really interesting one a few few months ago it was something it was some obscure disease that has to do with your internal organs and the APA put out a set of treatment guidelines if you're working for with people who have this obscure disease okay so it's not unusual that they put out treatment guidelines they put out in January 18 January 2019 these guidelines for working with boys and men and it is uh not a disease by the way well you <laughs> according to them it all might right be. yeah it's 10 guidelines for working with boys and men, and it is just dripping. I mean, absolutely dripping with feminist ideology, and we should define feminism at some point, but I'm talking about radical, man-hating, intersectional, angry, organized feminism that comes out of gender studies department and found its way into all kinds of things like human resources departments and other things and the APA guidelines for working with boys and men. Well, they want to smash the patriarchy. Right? This is the way to do it, huh? I guess so, yeah. So let's 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 define feminism because I think it's fair to say, I know a lot of people might get mad, the feminists particularly, that dominant feminism today is radical. It's it's like far left, authoritarian, intersectional, cancel culture, mm -hmm. woke, all of these things. And I've had conversations with you know women who are like, I'm a feminist because I believe in the equality between genders, and I'm like, that was like 40 years ago, right? Not even 40, maybe even longer than that, right? So now you have. I don't think it's, I guess we, we call it feminism, but it's something else. It's dogmatic, I don't know, intersectionality or wokeness or something. Some people call it a, a supremacist movement, a gender supremacist movement. I don't think that's too far in some cases, not certainly not in all cases, but let me, let me lay out what I think real feminism is. Can I tell you yeah. a story for a minute? Yeah. Okay. So in June, 2018, yeah, I'm sure you saw this story, a gender studies professor named Susanna Denuda Walters had an editorial in the Washington Post called Why Can't We Hate Men? Do you, do you remember that article? I, I vaguely do, yeah. Okay, so she made the case that, you know, the usual cases about uh, the gender pay gap and things, lots of complaints that have been debunked, you know, dredging up uh, complaints from the 1800s and so forth. And she was <laughs> making the case that any man who occupies any position of power or authority should step aside and just and hand that over to a woman because their women are entitled to hate us for for the way men have treated women over the centuries and, and she uses phrases like you we are entitled to hate you that's not her precise yeah. phrasing but she uses that that kind of phrasing and so back on on twitter back then i, I posted some things about this because i found it interesting and i got a lot of feedback from both sides and some of the feedback I got was well she's not a real feminist and I thought to myself okay well what is a real feminist so there seemed to be two camps because two women could describe themselves as feminist and mean two completely different things or two men for that matter one could could mean equality of opportunity and responsibility and she could be sort of joyful in her femininity and then there's Susanna Denuda Walters they could both call themselves feminist and mean opposite things yeah so what's the real feminism so let's say that there are I don't know a hundred million women in America who believe that feminism is about equality and it's about a shared responsibility and it's about um, taking accountability for your choices and your outcomes and a very positive view of femininity and masculinity there might be a hundred million women like that i don't know but what do they accomplish they accomplish nothing because they're they're not organized but over here we have this very small group of people who are on campuses people like Susanna Denuda Walters who are poisoning young minds they're organized 
they're funded, and their ideas find their way into the legal system. They find their way into treatment guidelines. They find their way into HR departments. They obviously find their way into the minds of young women, which is really unfortunate. Maybe we'll talk about dating feminists later. But um, So what's the real feminism? Is it the feminism that is the feminism of the large number that has no real effect because there are diffuse interests? Or is it the feminism that has real effects on real people's lives? To me, that's the real feminism is the one that's actually affecting people. I completely agree. I completely, that, was, that, that was a great way to put it. I, I view it as the dominant faction, whether they're bigger or smaller, is completely irrelevant. They're the funded and organized faction. And they're in medicine, they're in universities, they're in um, you know, movies, video games, comics, pop culture. Taylor Swift just came out with some video that was, you know, it, it's, it's also, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm coming back to the Taylor Swift thing, trust me, but it's like this weird stereotypical or like caricature of real life. Mm -hmm. She did this song called like The Man, I think, where she dresses up and does this thing where she's a man. And she literally says something like, I wonder how far I would have gotten if I was a man. And I'm like, Taylor, you're worth $360 million. She might you're, have made it to 361. Yeah, 361. Or she might have made it to less because she's yeah. an attractive woman. That's a part of why she yes. is famous in the first place. That's, that's probably the likelier scenario is that she would not have prospered quite as much. Yep. Yeah. And what's interesting too is in, you know, so she makes this video that propagates these ideas mm -hmm. that are, I mean, at the very least, completely exaggerated at, you know, in the worst case, they're completely wrong. This idea that in the entertainment industry, she would have fared better as a, as a man and maybe as like a producer, you would, she would have made yeah. a six figure salary, but her, her whole life was, was charmed from a young age, performing at you know, high profile events, going to Montessori school, mm -hmm. having her stockbroker father pay her way through everything. And then she made it. And she made it because she's an attractive white woman. So I think it's I think it's particularly funny that, you know, as much as I don't like to play into the racial stereotypes, things that they, they tend to do, it does tend to be white women who push these ideas. I don't know if you've seen the data on this. They go ahead. They tend to be college educated white women who make more than one hundred thousand dollars a year who are pushing this particular ideology. And for some reason, they're making gains. Particularly, I think with you know your area of expertise is the APA now creating, I guess, a clinical guideline for how to treat the element that is masculinity. Right. So uh, let's 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 dive into that. And uh, I I made the joke; it's not a disease. You said something like, "Hold on." Well, according to the APA, it's a collection of uh, traits that amount to a disease. Like there's stoicism, which is bad according to them. There's competitiveness. <laughs> oh no! There's, there's aggression. <laughs> um, yeah, so stoicism, stoicism. Well, not not that, the philosophy, but you know, containing your emotions. That's a. I thought that was a great thing. I think that's it's fantastic. A, it's a useful thing. Everybody should have this skill to some degree, and you know, it can be taken too far. But as far as I'm calling it toxic, what they've done with these guidelines is they have taken a lot of maladaptive coping strategies, like stoicism, taken too far. So that might look like a guy who refuses to articulate to himself or anybody else that he's really struggling with something so he hits the sauce and he turns he becomes an alcoholic so that would be stoicism taking to an extreme that's a maladaptive coping strategy right. what they've done is they've taken masculinity and they've taken all these maladaptive coping strategies and they've balled them all up together and conflated them to give the impression that these maladaptive coping strategies represent men we could do the same thing with women it would be just as absurd but there are maladaptive coping strategies that women are prone to like uh, prescription substance abuse they, they do that a little more often than men uh, person certain personality disorders they do more often than men uh, martyring themselves uh, you know victim do, points yeah vic well, well or or victim points but even just legitimately not speaking their own inter for their own interest and so they end up kind of angry at everybody around them that's more of a, a feminine trait. Guys do that too. They do it a little bit differently. But we could take all of these maladaptive coping strategies that tend to correlate and cluster around women, and we can say, well, that's that's toxic femininity. But that would be just as ridiculous as <laughs> saying that, you know, a, a guy who's an alcoholic is representative of of masculinity. Yeah. Well, so now are are, are psychologists actually treating people based on this stuff? This is a scary thing. Okay, so. Why do these guidelines matter? They matter because the American Psychological Association is the largest, um, that's the word I'm looking for, we, when a school gets, uh, oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue, they, they approve schools, right? 
Accreditation. Oh, accreditation. accreditation. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. They're the largest accrediting body for, for psychology training programs. Yeah. So even though the, the guidelines themselves, they don't affect someone like me because I'm in private practice and I'm not, there's no law that says I have to follow these guidelines. But if you're a training program and you want to remain accredited, which is really important, it's so important that your graduates won't be taken seriously if you don't have accreditation. They'll have more difficulty getting licensed. They'll definitely have trouble getting that, that postdoc job and so forth. So if you want your program to be accredited and you want people to actually come to your program, well, guess what? You better fall in line. And falling in line, I have to assume in this case, means it, it means you follow the APA guidelines because it is APA accreditation. So the APA guidelines for treating men and boys is going to come into play when you're treating men and boys in your training clinic. So the APA is in the position I can't tell you to what extent they're doing this, but I have watched people go through, uh, organizations go through accreditation review and everybody's stressed out. It's a very stressful event because the APA is scrutinizing your program very closely. So they're in the position to make sure that their professors and supervisors are are feeding this, force feeding this ideology, this angry feminist ideology to their students and that their students, at least while they're training, are force feeding this ideology to their clients wow and this is creepy stuff it is creepy stuff and they even say i don't forget which guideline it is exactly but um they they openly say that when psychologists um (laughs) impose this ideology on their male clients that their male clients are then more likely to go out and support social justice causes They, they very openly advocate for psychologists to push this ideology on their on their clients. This is, and by the way, this is this is in flat contradiction to the APA's own ethical guidelines. The first ethical guideline is, is principle A, beneficence and non, non-maleficence. And it says that you don't use the clinical relationship to advance your own agenda. Well, here's the APA using wow. the clinical relationship to advance their political wow. agenda. And I want to be clear that I find their identitarian, radical, angry ideology to be particularly damaging, but I would have the same stance if they were advancing an ideology that resonated with me. It's not their place to use the clinic and the classroom to tell people what to think, but that's exactly what they're doing. I don't know why I'm the only one yelling about it, but... Um, uh, because people are scared. They'll, they'll, they'll show up with a crowbar. They'll show yeah. up with a bike lock. Well... And in my profession, you know, if you if you have a regular job, I'm in private practice, so I, yeah. my, my clients come to me, they seek me out. But if I had a regular job at a prison or, or some kind of, you know, or, or at a university, I could be saying these things. Wow. The, the, the thing about them force feeding the ideology down the pipeline is, is creepy. That's why it's, I said it's, really it's scary. It is. Because it sounds like you've basically got a bunch of people who are, you know, to an effect, you know, understanding they're being basically jammed in a machine to shape their their minds and bodies in this creepy way yeah. and it's moving through them begrudgingly but it is it's like there's this nefarious faction of people and it's almost like they're jamming a, a round peg through a square hole or you know a square peg through a round hole just mashing it with a hammer to make it go through in the hopes that there's going to be some 10 year old kid who hears it and just says okay yeah. Because the next generation, so so the way I see it is, the people won't speak up, at least in my opinion, because they know that someone might show up and say, you're fired. Someone might show up with a black mask and a, and a crowbar and say, you're a fascist. Mm-hmm. So they just say, you got it. But those kids hear it un- uncritically. And so they're believing it all now. And maybe that's the goal. They can bend you into submission. You, They'll fire you. They'll come for your job. But as long as you say what they want you to say, the kids will believe it, and those kids will embrace it wholeheartedly when they're your age. Well, and, and this message from the APA that, toxic, that masculinity is toxic, it's, it's really destructive for, for boys and young men because um, one of the things that, that went along with these guidelines was there was an article that got a lot of press. There was an article in the APA Monitor, which is a magazine, basically. Um, do a little bit of research, but talking about what's going on in the profession, what's going on in the APA. So when they released these guidelines a few months later, then they put out this article and there was a line in the article that got a lot of play. And it said that toxic masculinity, which is defined by stoicism, competitiveness, aggression, or, or sorry, masculinity, which is characterized by toxic uh, or by um, um, stoicism, competitiveness, aggression. And I forget the, the four terms they use, but it was those, those four things that it is on the whole harmful. So what they're saying is that 
masculinity is harmful because it's characterized by these things. And so if you're a young man and you're getting this message, and you're, you're not probably not reading the AP monitor, but you're getting it from your teachers. Maybe your parents buy into it. Maybe you have, unfortunately, some kind of uh, brush with the mental health system and you're getting it from there. You're getting it from these, these sources that masculinity is toxic. Well, that's a very shaming message. And I gotta tell you, there's, there's nothing more dangerous than a man who has taught to be repulsed by himself. That's the man that goes out and does the things actually that the APA is saying all men yeah. do. That's the man that's truly dangerous because he hates himself. And so he's going to make sure that the rest of the world pays for that. I want to make sure we, 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 we have something absolutely clear too, because I know that we said basically, you know, in the title, I say toxic masculinity is a lie, but this article in the New York Times says traditional masculinity. <laughs> right. So this is, this, right. this, this is what's so, you know, uh, disconcerting to me, I guess, is that we, we first started hearing toxic masculinity. No, 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 masculinity is fine. Toxic masculinity is bad. Right. All the Twitter feminists started saying, all these men who are getting butt hurt, we're not targeting masculinity, we're targeting toxic masculinity. Right. And then once they weaseled their way in enough, they started saying, well, right, but traditional masculinity is rooted in some toxic behaviors, right? Now here we are straight up, traditional masculinity bed. Right. It's so, that concept creep. Right. They get yep. their foot in the door and then they, they just up the ante a little bit more all the time. So it's, yeah, now it's, it's masculinity in general that is a disease. Have you, you saw the Gillette commercial, I imagine. Yes. Yeah. So what's one of the ways I think they creep this idea is, so they show some things that are objectionable. Bullying, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, nobody likes bullying, you know, to, to a certain degrees. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, I think there's a scale between kids roughhousing and being, you know, a bit aggressive and kids being direct bullies and actually punching a kid right. or hurting them. And but what, boys need horseplay. Right, it's exactly. It's a requirement. So, you know, look, when I, I, I think... There's there's a there's an imbalance between one kid who's too much of a bully and one kid who's too weak and that causes problems mm -hmm. goes out of control. But when I was a kid, we had competition, we had conflict, and we learned how to resolve that. Mm -hmm. And with within certain reason, you know, I had a kid who picked a fight with me, and you got to learn to stand up for yourself. You know, be mature. It doesn't mean fight. It means these are these are conflict. You have to learn how to deal with. But uh, anyway, I digress. So, so so there's there's things in the commercials we we absolutely can find objectionable. Right. But there was one part where a guy's leaning up against the wall and a woman walks past him and he, he makes like the ooh face. And then some guy stops him and says, no, don't do it. Yeah. And I'm like, that to me was part of the ideological creep in that they have now started conflating talking with a stranger, like meeting a new person with harassing a person. Yes. So there was also that video, 10 hours of walking through New York as a woman, mm -hmm. where you literally had them complaining that a guy said, how's it going? And now that's where they start conflating a guy who yells, you know, hollering at a girl saying gross things and a guy tipping his hat and saying, ma'am. So, uh, you know, the, the crazy thing to me is if you literally can't walk up to another woman and say, hi, I just wanted to introduce myself and trying to meet new people because that's, a to that's toxic masculinity. They have now literally, it's not just about masculinity. They've now toxified basic human behavior yep. and force you to repress all everything you do. And then I'm not surprised to find that guys become reclusive, lock themselves away. Like you said, it's the people who are told to be repulsed by themselves that do the crazy things. You know, uh, do you know what reset the clock is? No. I don't want to deviate too much from the APA stuff until we can move to the sec next segment, but there's a meme called reset the clock. What do we do when we reset the clock? Uh, days since a male feminist sexually assaulted a feminist or woman. Say, say that again, a male feminist. Days, okay, okay. so the clock is days since a male feminist sexually assaulted a woman. Has it ever been past zero? Um, well, I mean, yes, but it's, that's it's, one that's, that's the meme, right? right? It's, they say that whenever the story comes out, because so many have come out. Right. And so there's something interesting. It's like, why is it that the men who are more likely to buy into all this stuff seem to be more likely to attack these women? And I think it was Patton Oswalt, the comedian who said, uh, male feminists abusing women is this generation's Republican, you know, anti-gay Republican turning out to be gay. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder if there's some if, if that fits in with like the way you, what you're saying, you have these men who buy into this. We also have this meme. It may, not, may, not, may not be related, but certainly we're seeing something like this has even been pointed out by some comedians. Is that kind of in in the line of with what you were kind of saying about men who are repulsed by themselves? And yeah, it could be. There could be a couple things going on there. That could be just that 
you know, I, I've seen what appears to me to be men who are pretending to be feminists. <laughs> so that they right, can, right. So they can get what they want. Yep. And I think, I don't know what percentage that is, but I think that that factors in. But yeah, you, when, when you shame men and you shame normal interactions like i can i can picture that scene from gillette that right we were talking right about. like I mean, what is it? the reason i can picture it is because it was so outlandish the guy made an expression that nobody makes and and right it's just such a biz- <laughs> bizarre contrived no, no, but, 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 sorry yeah. I, I keep put a tag on that yeah it's like i was saying about the taylor swift video they've created this fictional reality of what they yeah. think is actually happening yeah. and then tell these young people this is real life it's like never happens man yeah yeah but but i don't know i don't want to pull off your train of thought well no it, you didn't and it's what's so intriguing about the apa because they do have one foot in the clinical world and they're dealing with real people and i don't know how you have this this ideology that says half the people are, are mentally ill just by default because of their <laughs> chromosome arrangement and work with those people that's right. why the clinicians that i know that I, I associate with a lot of clinicians that work in the real world they're in the trenches they don't have that ideology because they're working with real people and it's yeah. really hard to hate a group of people when you're working with them dealing with them on a day-to-day basis yep. and finding out that hey you know these people struggle like everybody else struggles they're and, demonizing basic masculine behaviors yeah to, to me the stoicism thing is the crazy thing Aren't we like proud of like stoicism? Like it's typically a positive thing. Well, Am I we wrong are. about this? <laughs> yeah, there's a use for it, and I'll, I'll give you an example of a use you know, where the masculine and the feminine really play off nicely each other. So imagine you're you're driving down the highway, and a family's driving this. Sorry, family's driving down the highway. You got a mother, father, a couple kids in the back seat, and tire blows. Right, so it's raining outside. It's cold. The tire blows. Everybody's upset. So the mother is going to be very stoic in that situation. I, I, I guess typically in traditional masculinity, the kind of masculinity that the APA hates, the man would go out <laughs> and start changing the tire. Mm-hmm. And so you have this man who's out there stoically changing the tire and demonstrating to his family, hey, it's under control. It's, it's cool. Maybe if, and if he's really skilled father, he's joking about it and he's mm-hmm. lightening the mood for everybody. That's the stoicism. Wow. And, and the mother stays behind and she makes sure that everybody is emotionally safe. Again, in this traditional math, you know, this right, right, right. traditional masculine. <laughs> she's making sure that everybody's safe and comfortable. And meanwhile, the, the, the stoic, toxically masculine man is out there fighting the wolves. She's only changing a tire, but you get my point. He's out in the cold and, and, and the wilderness this, and, and dealing with things. This reminds me of a story I read in a magazine. There was a family that was on the beach when, uh, I don't remember exactly where it was, it may, may, may have been the Northwest or something, but a black wolf emerges from, you know, walking down the beach. Uh-huh. And the family, father, the mother, and their two kids, swim out to a rock not too far away and are shivering and huddling in fear as the wolf paces back and forth. And I was thinking about that story, I'm like, what would have happened a couple hundred years ago? Would the father have been armed? Would he have, you know, if he was taking his family for an outing, would yeah. he have been armed and would he have said, stand behind me and then drawn his blade to combat the wolf? Yeah. Have we be, you know, I was thinking, I, I thought about a lot about certain things about, that are kind of good in a lot of ways. We don't wear our armor anymore. This is a good thing. It's uncomfortable. Right. It's itchy. Yes. But we were real, really concerned that, you know, a bandit would lurk in the forest and right. attack you. And these things still kind of happen. But, and, and, and to an extent, there's kind of bad things. Like one of the reasons we don't wear armor anymore is because weapons have advanced to a point where it'd be pointless. Yeah. But we don't, for the most part. We don't drive in tanks, though. We don't drive in so, tanks. Yeah. Uh, we don't wear bulletproof vests. We don't, most, most people in most urban areas don't need to carry weapons, though that can be debated by a lot of people. Mm. I think there's a, we, there are still parts of the country where this is still a concern. But we've really progressed to a point where we don't have, you know, I don't, I don't want to act like men aren't stoic and aren't being defensive because you brought up a good example of keeping calm and changing the tire, but it's very different from being attacked by a bear when your yeah. family was out living in the you know, middle, of no, uh, middle of nowhere, or at least in the wilderness as a pioneersman or something. So you can see like the dr- drastic difference between how the worlds used to be. You know, back a couple hundred years ago, everybody was walking around armed to the teeth. Yeah. Today, people walk around in t-shirts. But in that in that same sense, we are still on the track, it seems, towards leaving behind the survival capability of one of which is remaining calm. Yes. I have a textbook, a, a, an introductory psychology textbook is from 1949. A friend of mine gave this to me a long time ago. And it, it's written like at a high school level it seems like it's it's so the language is pretty pretty basic and it's introducing some very basic concepts but 
it talks about character, which is something that my profession doesn't really talk about much anymore is character. And under character, you see these traits that um, it's, it's kind of comically masculine. Like one of the things they, they talk about, they, I forgot the exact word they use, but it's the word to, it was that word contemporaneously that sorry, I'm using the wrong word. The word they used back then to describe stoicism yeah, yeah. It was staying, keeping your emotions under control. They, they had a couple paragraphs about the value of being able to stay calm while everything around you is falling apart. So tire blows and it's raining out. You keep cool. You go out, you handle it. All right. So we, my profession has gone from that being a value that that's <laughs> worth teaching yeah. to kids to now it's, it's mental illness. So, so there's there's a uh, another story I like to reference. I don't remember exactly where I read this, but they said that there was a U.S. military, a navy, naval vessel uh-huh. that was, uh, or maybe it may have been on a small army ship was was sunk, damaged, and the you know U.S. servicemen got on a, a, a raft, and they credit the survival of this group because one of the men took out his service weapon, dismantled it piece by piece, and took out every bullet and gave each individual a single piece. And then said, remember what your job is. This is yours. This piece is yours. We're going to rebuild this weapon. And then they went one at a time. And they said, this structured, this simple practice took people out of panic. Mm-hmm. It, it gave them a more structured frame of mind, helped calm them down. And they credit that with the ability to form a plan, to ration, to survive. I don't know if it's true or if it was an example. I was reading in a book about panic, survival and panic. Mm-hmm. So if, if, if you have, you know, a, a family... And the father, and I think I think anybody can be so. The mother can be calm and rational Absolutely. and help survive. Yes, and that's Absolutely. why I'm surprised because this is a good thing. And it's not a, it's not a masculine trait. Stoicism is not a gendered trait. Right. Men men may act it out more than women in certain contexts, but women do it too. What would happen if that tire exploded, and they skidded, and they're in the middle of the Pacific Northwest in the storm? It's uh, almost. It's getting late. It's cloudy. And the mother and the father both start crying and panicking, <laughs> right. and the kids are sitting in the back crying and panicking, and then... Well, according then to the APA, <laughs> the APA, that would be perfectly healthy. <laughs> the right response. Well, he's letting out his emotions. They're going to die, yeah. but at least they feel better about themselves. Right. Yeah. Thanks for checking out this segment from the TimCast IRL podcast. We do the show every Monday through Friday at 8 p.m., sometimes an hour or two. And we do have a full live recorded version of the show that includes a lot of comments and smaller segments you probably don't see. If you want to check that out, you can watch live at 8 p.m. Monday through Friday or become a member of this channel. And for five bucks a month, you get full access to all of the recorded podcasts every day after the show. We make them available in the community section of this YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe and stick around for more segments and more shows Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. Thanks for hanging out and we will see you all in the next show.